Hi, I'm Paul Bunak. Welcome to the JKD Street Fighting Series. This particular tape is Bruce Lee Straight Blast. Hi, I'm Paul Bunak. Welcome to the Straight Blast. What exactly is a Straight Blast? Well, it's a move that they do in Wing Chun where they're rolling their fists and they're going forward. And if you do this properly, and if your fists are in center line as you're rolling, your opponent's fists are not in center line. And provided that you're going in with forward pressure, there's a time and a place that this can be your opponent's worst nightmare. In 1964, Bruce Lee first introduced the straight blast. The first thing the wrestler said when he introduced this was, oh, I'll go under him, double A takedown. The karate guy saw this. Oh, no power. Doesn't come from the hip. The boxer. Yo, man, I'll just hook him. But every one of those people, when Bruce got in front of them, well, all that pon uh, pontificating just went out the window. So the point is, when this is done at the right place, at the right time in a fight, it can be very dangerous. And that's what we're going to show you right now. Now let's get into the fundamentals of the straight blast. And I also want to compare the way Bruce did it with the way Wing Chun does it. First of all, the way Wing Chun Man will blast is he'll keep the same leg in front. The purpose for this is one of their reasons, one of their rationale, is to protect the groin. Okay? So let me first of all show you their way. They're going to keep one leg in front and they're going to blast something like that. I've talked to a hundred Wing Chun Men and I've got a hundred different answers of how they blast. Just like a hundred different ways of how they cheese out. If you went into a boxing gym you'd hear a hundred different ways of how to jab. But basically speaking they keep the same leg in front. Some advocate locking the arm out completely, some, ad some don't. I don't, because it's bad on the elbows. The point of a straight blast is to apply as much pressure as you can on your opponent. You cannot enter on the straight blast unless you've already inflicted pain. If you're standing there passively waiting, and then all of a sudden you come in with a blast, yeah, the wrestler might have been right. He probably could take you for a double-A takedown, or the boxer may be able to hook you. So the point is, you need to inflict pain first. You need to get that first shot in. This is where Bruce saw the limitations of Wing Chun. Because they're going to sit and wait for that shot and enter in a defensive mode, and they're going to keep the same leg in front. How Bruce changed it to make it more aggressive was he moved around from out here. Bruce was not a Wing Chun man in long range. In long range, Bruce was a savat man, a little bit of a Thai boxer, a little bit of a fencer, a little bit of a Western boxer, and a little bit of his own stuff. But then the minute he enters, the minute he touches, that's when this blast comes in. So if you've already hit your opponent with a nice shot to the groin or a good kick to the thigh or a nice eye jab, and then the very next beat is when your blast comes in, and then it's brrrr, you don't need to worry whether your groin's open. You can't even see your groin when you hit it. So for that reason, we don't keep the same leg in front. We run. So I'm going to give you one way to practice the very fundamental aspects of a blast. I want you to start right here with a line, move around a little bit like a boxer, bop, 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 and get about four shots. Don't go fast, just play with it. Move around. Sometimes just try to sprint. Just give me a little run. Just like a runner, you're going to counterbalance naturally when you run. Okay? Otherwise, you're going to be marching. Well, when you blast, just use those same motions to just roll. So you're moving around, and that's all you're doing. It looks silly, but it's very effective once we put it in the whole matrix of the street fight. Now, we've just talked about how the straight blast is implemented in the matrix of a street fight. Well, it's not implemented in the beginning. It's in the midpoint of the fight. The very beginning, 
As we've said before, we want to take attributes from fencing, we want to take attributes from savat, from Thai boxing, from Western boxing. So we want to be moving around, and from Kali. And we want to be moving around in this position, and we want to stay light on our feet and moving around and up on our toes. This is the key. The most important thing is that we inflict pain prior to the blast. So then we have to ask ourselves, what is the most efficient way to do that? Well, Bruce came up with the stop hit, which is let from fencing. Every time the opponent moves, especially if it's a wide punch, boom, you just come in and you intercept with an eye jab, or you intercept with a kick to the groin, or a shot to the knee. So the one way we enter is we're moving around. Somebody comes in, boom, and we do that little stop hit. The minute we do the stop hit, then we're going to enter with a blast. The other way is the Kali way, meaning we're not intercepting this person coming in. We're allowing him to throw his tool out, and then we're destroying that tool still inflicting pain, still preventing him from countering us on the way in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull one of my guys out, and we're going to go defense against the jab. And we're going to go all the way down the list, the boxer against the kicker against the tie boxer. We're going to show you how you use all of these tools as an entry, but the common denominator is we're going into the straight blast. And we're going to put the helmet on. We're only going to go about a half speed. All right, now watch what we're doing. Okay, Brian, why don't you come on in? Okay, let's put the helmet on. <coughs> Now, what we're going to be doing here is Brian's going to move around. You have to remember the key here, progression. He's not going to be throwing uppercuts or hooks or swinging wild, but he is going to try to hit me. And it's just going to be with a jab. I'm going to get out of the way a little bit, and I'm going to go with the de destruction of the arm, which is calling. Okay, Brian, move around. Now, if you watched what I was doing, all we did was isolate the blast. All Brian did was isolate the jab. Had we have thrown in the cross, the kicks, that would have confused things. So we need to learn how to learn the blast with the progression. Now, let's move along. Remember, the key is progression. I just got through doing destructions against just the jab. You would do that for perhaps maybe a week, two weeks, a month, just against the jab until you have it down. Do it against a guy who's tall, a guy who's short guy who's stocky, any kind of rhythm, but get it against that jab. You want a thousand guys throwing a jab at you and get that line of familiarization down. Then we gradually increase the amount of tools that your opponent throws at you. And simultaneously, we gradually increase the amount of pressure that we put on him. Remember, when he's boxing, he can hit you and you hit his helmet. Well, he's not feeling that. So the pain element is not there. They don't tend to cover quite as good as in the street fight. So what we're doing now is we're going to add one other element, and Dion's going to throw in the rear hand. But I want you to understand something. Right now, in my mind's eye, I'm equating against the boxer. And I'm assuming that this boxer is a better boxer than me. A guy who can move and hit the body, and you're going to go down. So I don't see his hands. I don't see his upper body. The minute the guy's moving around like this, my preliminary analysis in the fight is, hmm, boxer, okay? You're not really sub-vocalizing. You're not thinking. But that's your feel. You've seen this guy move around, you've got to get a feel for what he has. So don't box with him. As soon as you see this boxer coming in to where we get into his game, right here, all I see is a little groin, maybe a big groin, coming in. That's all I see. And as soon as it comes in, bam, you hit it. I don't care about his punches. Same thing with the leg. That sciatic nerve runs all the way down the back and down here. So when that boxer comes in, bam, as soon as I see him coming in, I'm wrapping that leg. Then I'm barring that moment in time when he's in pain to go into a form of pressure that a boxer has never seen before. Because you're doing the 50-yard dash down his center line. Okay, Dion. So what did we do before? We just threw the jab. Now we're going to add the jab and the cross. Um, put your helmet on there. I think that'll work out better for you, Dean. Okay, move around. Now, if you notice, what we're doing is we're moving around, we're taking our shots, D's trying to hit me with that punch, I'm taking the thigh out. Now our next line is going to be, we're going to add the hook. 
Now, where are we along our progression? We've done the jab, we've done the cross, now I'd like to work the swinging motion. In karate, this could represent a ridge hand or a crane's beak or whatever. Okay, that would be gung fu. So what we're saying here is we're defending against any line of hook. And then we defend against any line that comes up, and then any line that comes over. And that's it. That's it. Unless we've got a third arm somewhere, those are the only lines. This is why we equate most of our stuff against the boxer. Because it really doesn't matter what weapon your hand is formating. If you're going to defend against this swing, it wouldn't matter if it's a swing or a ridge hand or a crane's beak or a buffalo eyebrow. I don't care what that tool is, okay? It's swinging. So when I see a swing, bam, I'm just intercepting. And the minute I intercept, that's my blast. So we're now looking against a fighter who's moving around, sort of like a Frazier, and he's coming in with a wild shot. Okay, Makoto, come on in. Brad, stick on the helmet. So we're isolating, almost like if you were a shortstop and you just wanted to pick up grounders. He's going to hit you 100 grounders. We're just isolating that one swing, and I'm going to intercept it. I'm going to stop it. Okay, move around back. just see. Makoto was moving around with a straight line. He threw a miss line. But the minute I saw him loading up, that's when I intercepted. Came in for the blast. Now what we've got is the jab, the cross, the hook. Now we're going to add the other two punches, the uppercut and the overhand. Remember, the key is progression. You wouldn't do this the same day. This might take you weeks, months, years to work up to where you've got a good, big, heavyweight boxer in front of you trying to hit you, and you get your timing until where you can get in. And when you get in, you do your blast. After the blast, that's where the head butts, the knees, the elbows, and everything comes in. But right now, we're just going to the blast. Okay, so watch what we're doing. Pat, come on out. Put the gear on. Once I make one pass, once I make my entry, go our goal is to make one pass at this guy. Once you hang on, you're, it's like riding the tiger. You don't want to dismount. Last thing I want is a separation again. So pay attention to what I'm going to do, because I'm going to get to his neck somehow. Okay, move around. Now what we just got through doing was entering with a straight blast against the boxer. We did it in such a progression that finally we got it to where he's going every punch he can. And you're trying to enter with a kick, although that's not hurting him because you get the pads on, then you're going into the blast, trying to get this guy to cover. From there we're going to flow into one of the other arts. We don't know what art that's going to be. You have to keep in mind that there is no superior art. This is something we've been trying to tell people for years. So if there's no superior art all the time, the goal in JKD is find the superior art at the moment. So out of this straight blast, if the guy's backpedaling like that, you may go into Tai Chi, just because you need to push his body. Maybe a car's going by, whatever. If you're doing your straight blast and the guy tries to push you off this way, you might flow into an arm wrench. So regardless of what it is you're doing to this guy, if you enter with this blast, this is what's going to make every other art work. Now what we're going to do is we're going to have Brad throw kicks. I'm going to defend against the kicks using some sort of destruction from Kali, and then I'm going to enter with a blast. But this time, after the blast, we're going to flow into one of the appropriate arcs. Now, for sake of training, you have to tell your training partner what energy to give you. And the particular energy that's most conducive to bringing out Tai Chi, which gives you the ability to sail a body quickly, is when a guy's kind of backpedaling like this, and he's got his feet sort of together. When you give him a sail, he'll move. 
So what we're going to do is we're having Brad try to kick me. We're sparring that way, but once I make my entry, I go into a little bit of Wing Chun, he's going to give me the appropriate energy, and I'm going to flow into Tai Chi. Okay, Brad. Yeah, we're going to put that up. Now, if you notice what I did, every time I would get his momentum moving from blasting, I would borrow one beat and flow into Tai Chi. Now, let's move along to one of our next tools. This is one of my favorite tools. I've noticed you get this energy a lot in a street fight. And that is when you're crawling down somebody's throat and they're getting hit several times, their natural visceral knee-jerk response is to kind of push you away like that. And every time they do that, they're saying, please, break my arm okay, or break this one. So immediately when you're punching, you're going to get the guy that does that. And when you do that, if you can flow right into an arm wrench, that is a tool that is going to take any man out of commission. doesn't matter how big or how strong, it's a moot point. When this arm bends this way, I don't know many people that can come on this side and hit you. So what we're going to do is we look at the arm wrench as one of our major tools. And once again, it's out of the straight blast. Everything works out of this blast. It's no coincidence when Bruce used this 99% of the time when he was serious in a fight. What he would do after this, well, that's another story. What appropriate art. All right, right now we're going to go into the arm wrench. Okay, Rob, come on in. Throw the helmet. When you work this, the man that's feeding the energy, always keep a very slight bend in that arm in case the other guy gets overzealous. I don't mind hitting the guy in the nose on accident or even in the balls on accident, but you don't want to ever break somebody's elbow. Okay, that's going to take your buddy out for a long time. All right, Rob, move around with me. Now remember, Rob is going to back up the way he normally would, only he's going to straight arm that thing as soon as he sees me coming in. Now, you see what happened? I was feeding here. Rob would come in for a couple times this way. Then all of a sudden, he changed it. He made me make about three passes. He gave me this. When I saw it, I took it. That would have been the end of the fight. Now, for sake of simplicity, we're not going to actually go in and hit every time. We're going to go through the techniques that you can flow out of the straight blast. We're going to do that arm wrench one more time. I'm not going to really hit Rob. We're just going to simulate that. That way, we can see it a little bit clearer. Okay, Rob, come on and move around with me a little bit. But no matter what we do, notice we're not starting from, say, a reference point or a grab or worse yet. And then the guy's... Bruce used to call that dissecting a corpse. We're always doing it out of movement, regardless. So he's going to throw a jab, a few kicks. I'm going to move around and go in and blast. I'm not really going to hit. He's going to give me that arm wrench energy. We want you to see that clearly. Okay, move around a little bit. That's the energy we're looking for. When you can get your opponent to do that, we're clear right on it. Now we're going to implement Savat after the straight blast. Just to tell you a little story, Bruce and a guy named Wong Jackman a lot of years ago had a fight. And when Bruce entered, all he did was blast the guy. And Wong Jackman was turning around, starting to run, and had Bruce have implemented a kick that would have stopped the momentum of Wong Jackman, and then he could have caught up again. Instead, he chased him around the room, and he got tired. So this is one of the reasons why Bruce implemented Sabat, because you don't always do things right. A basketball player doesn't always make a basket. A football player doesn't always make a touchdown. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to blast this guy. We're trying to grab his neck and do our thing. But sometimes we don't do it. He gets out of the way. Instead of chasing him, the minute he gets out of the way, boom, we put that little hook kick in, catch his momentum, and then catch up again. Okay, let's do it, D. <coughs> Have you over here. We're just going to go slow, move around.
Good. So if you notice what happened is every time I would blast, boom, it just went right into the kick. If had I really hit, I could have borrowed that moment and then come into this. Now what we're going to do is we're going to move along to Wing Chun. The man's going to give you an obstruction after he gets his face hit a bunch of times. Except he's not going to really lock the arm out. He's going to give it about halfway. When he gives you that feeling, it's a little bit too far to go for that arm wrench. So it's, a, it's an obstruction. We use it. We trap it. We're going to go right back to Wing Chun again. But then we're going to move up to the head, and boom, we're going to slam the head in for Dumog. And at this point, the fight would pretty much be over. But for, for sake of training, we're then going to take the man down and get onto mounted position, and then just go right into an arm lock. Because when you're on top of the chest, punching the face, once again, his response is 99% of the time to do one of two things. He's going to try to turn like an ostrich putting his head in the sand, or he's going to try to push you off. Either one he does, we have a counter immediately. Once again, trying to break that elbow. All right, let's pl play with it. <coughs> Moving right along now, the next element we're going to get into is foot sweeps. I'm not going to give it an art because every art in the world has a foot sweep. We're going to be entering, we're doing our thing, and he's going to kind of leave that leg out. For whatever reason, he just turns that way. You'll get this reaction once in a while. It's sort of like a mountain that's there, you just got to take it. Foot sweeps, locks, flips, throws, anything that's not boom, is ballistic is accidental if not incidental. So that's the key. So I'm not really looking for this. Just for this particular training method, Pat's going to back up. And he's going to leave that leg out so I can train it. But the key is we're not training it from a static position. We're training it from the blast. And eventually, once again, like we had done before, we're going to put the helmet on, put the gloves on, and go for it. But for sake of training, we can slow everything down for the purpose of the video, and you can see it a little bit better. Okay, Pat, move on. Now, right at this point, this is where my elbow would bury right into the back. However, for training, we just wanted to get the response and feel the leg. Foot sweeps. Now, let's follow along with what we've done so far. Remember, everything's come out of the blast. We've done Wing Chun, we've done arm wrenches, we've done some foot sweeps, we've done some Tai Chi, we've done some Savat. Now, the energy that this man is going to give us is going to bring out Thai boxing. And the energy is that he's going to roll completely. He's going to try to cover over that shoulder. You get that a lot, especially with a big man with a big back. You can elbow the back, sometimes that gets an effect, but it's better just to give that tie shot and just bury it right on that thigh. So once again, I'm telling Dion what to do, what energy to give me, and he's going to do it. And I'm going to come in and blast, and boom, come with a thigh shot. We have no hands to work with because he's covered here, so we flow into tie boxing. Before we do, I just want to bring up one other point. The reason we're going into tie boxing and not Wing Chun is his energy. And I have to keep reiterating that point to you. There is no superior art. It's like rock, paper, and scissors. All the, this depends on is what energy this man gives you. There's a time and place for Wing Chun. There's a time and place for Tai Chi. To quote Bruce Lee, there's a place where kicking will beat any boxing art. There's a place where boxing will beat any Tai Chi art. And there's a place where Tai Chi will beat any kicking art. So like food or anything else, we want to taste everything. And we want to absorb what's useful and reject what's useless. And our criteria for what's useful is what's going to work in a street fight. We don't need to learn all of Thai boxing. We don't learn, need to learn all of Wing Chun. We just need the bits and pieces that are conducive for a street fight. Okay, D, you ready? Good, great. Did you see the energy he was giving me? Perfect. He'd throw his jab, he was really trying to hit me, but then he was getting out of the way when I came in. Always giving me that nerve. Tie boxing. Now let's move on to locks. Remember, locking is something that's incidental if not accidental. You're punching. This is what we call sort of an arbitrary response. You slip out of the way and you just go for it with a blast. You're looking for the head butts, you're looking for the elbows, and you're looking for the knees. That's our self-preservation. From there, if we want to vent into self-perfection, this is where locks come in. This is where the other arts come in that you can do until you're 70 or 80 years old. If I have a six-foot-five Samoan pissed off at me right here, the last thing I'm going to be doing is looking for that wrist lock. 
However, it's a nice way to train and teaches you sensitivity. Okay, Dion, I don't know what lock I'm going to do. I'm going to come in and blast. He's going to give me an energy. I'm going to go into something. Okay. Now, as you notice, I'm just punching. I'm looking for a reference point. I'm looking for something to grab. As soon as I get it, my energy that he is giving me, he's telling me what lock to go into. This works a lot better when you're really hitting him. Now, let's flow into another element. Let's flow into some chokes. What are the purposes of a choke in a street fight? Put the guy asleep. He's not a very good fighter when he's asleep. So what we're doing is we're blasting. We're getting him to kind of turn. But for whatever reason, our energy takes us around the back. You never know why. You get a lot of weird positions in the street fight. So if it's there, you take it. You just put the sleeper right on. So we're going to try to fake the energy, and he's going to go for it. But once again, we're doing it out of movement. If this were real, once again, we would put the helmet on Rob and the boxing gloves, and we would go harder. And we would do this for days and months and years until we could do it. But for right now, this is how we begin our training. Watch the energy. <clears throat> And that's about our choke. It wouldn't take much longer than that. Once you wrap it right to here, you contract with the lats, and you'll feel the body starting to gel. At that point, I'd recommend you let go. Now what I'd like to do is pause for a moment and take some of my boys and just show you a little bit of how we train the straight blast. We're just going to isolate the straight blast for a few minutes. I want you to see the intensity and what they're doing. Of course, we would graduate this to where everybody's sparring full contact. But for right now, just to give you the basic, the rudimentary feeling of, of being able to blast and to get that intensity, this is the key. The boys have to be intense when they train. If you're not intense, if you're not blasting with a certain feeling, you're not doing it right. There's nothing, there's no better technique to bring out the heart and the killer instinct than to be doing the 50-yard dash so down some guy's center line. Imagine doing some jumping, spinning heel hook with the intensity. You just can't do it. All of a sudden, when you start doing this, it just comes out. And then you know from this, you're going to go right into this. So I want that feeling. So what I'm doing now is I'm bringing out the motor movement in the run, but I'm also bringing out the, the psychology, that feeling of intensity. And as you saw when we trained, sometimes you're intense, but the guy gets out of the way. So now you've got to move back around again. So we have to be able to change our emotional makeup. We have to be able to adjust to the opponent, adjust to the range. Emotionally, we have to fluctuate from here to here. That's difficult to do. If you can do that when you're in a street fight, hopefully you'll be able to do that in life. All right, let's take our boys right over here. We get everybody stand about right here. Face that direction. All I want you to do is get up on your toes, move around. When you hear that click, I want to blast. I want to hear it. I want you to get intense. I want to hear the elbows, knees, and head butts right from here. We're just going to do it in the air. Ready? Up on your toes and go! <laughs> Good. Other side. Stay right there. Coming back this way. Ready? Let me hear it. When you get into here, don't stop elbow, knee, and head butting. Okay, ready? Go! Good. Great. Other side. Ready? Going back the other direction. Up on your toes. Give me just a little bit more intensity. Otherwise, I'm going to thigh kick somebody. Ready? On your toes. Ready? Go! Go! Move it! Yes! Great. What you just saw there, we want to do for hours on end. I want you to do this in your sleep. When your girlfriend comes up to give you a hug, that should be your first response. I want this to be so ingrained in your brain. So really, all you have to do is move around and get that first shot in. If you get the first shot in, then you're into this. Then the guy is going to be here, and any art in the world will work. You put ballet in at that point. So what we're going to do is we're going to isolate this phase, the blast, over and over and over again. Then we put somebody in front of us, then we gradually progress until we put on the gloves, we put on the helmet till we're able to do it. I want you to have straight blasted anybody you can think of. Boxers, kickboxers, tie boxers, street fighters. Everybody gives you a different energy when you do this. And that's the key. Being in the kitchen and actually experiencing it. Remember, JKD is about the process, not the product.
Now, what I'd like you to remember is when you're in a street fight, there are different types of rhythm. There are different types of modes of attacks. Sometimes you engage your opponent and you're moving around and you go through the whole scheme, the whole preliminary analysis, the pot shotting, and then the rally. Other times, things just seem to happen a little bit quicker. You may be walking, somebody starts something, boom, there's this one punch thrown, and you're in another sort of rhythm. You don't have the time, you don't have the luxury to move around. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to emphasize that with you. And what we've done is we've taken from past experiences different types of rhythm. And now we're going to show them to you. One of them is what I call a three beat, which means somebody throws a punch at you and you get three good shots in, and that's usually when they cover. It's pop, 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 boom, and then they cover. So I'm going to give you a three beat rhythm and then come back with a headbutt. It's a pretty common rhythm in a street fight. And this is something I'd like you to isolate and work by yourself. Okay, Brad, why don't you come on in, let's get your helmet on. Now, for whatever reason, this fight's going to start. I'm going to be walking down this way. Brad's just going to pop a punch at me. Just a nice rear hand cross. Once again, he's trying to hit me. He's got the gloves on. We're not posing. He's trying to hit me a minute, but I know it's coming because we're isolating it. I'm going to get out of the way, and I'm going to give him a three-beat rhythm. And then I'm going to follow up with a headbutt. Okay, so we're walking. Okay, one more time. So as you see, what happened was, he threw the first punch, I got out of the way, but it was bump, bump, bump. And that's real common to get three beats in a row. The minute you get those three, the guy covers, bam, then you put the headbutt in. Let's go one more time, a little bit slower. Okay, so the first rhythm change I want you to work out is the one, two, three, boom. Now let's remember just how important rhythm is. The straight blast is really rhythm. You're setting a constant rhythm. It's syncopated. That's what you're getting with the blast. But in between that, you can enter on, say, a half beat. Or you can go blast, 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 and boom, full beat. And if you're aware of the different rhythms, this broadens the spectrum of time in which you can hit your opponent. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a constant rhythm, which is going to begin with a half beat. This is something you get in a, good, in a street fight a lot. You get a good boxer who's moving around, so you're getting that fake and you're going down to the groin. You're slapping his groin. Once you get the attention and you get that, then you move with him a little bit, and then you give that little fake. Now you're going to watch a boxer of 20 years doing that. So the minute you fake low, the hands are drawn down, you hit. That's where your half-beat rhythm is. It's chapop. And it's that chapop that I'm trying to get. Not boom. Boom. And when you hear the chip-pop, then we're going to flow right into the three-beat rhythm. Okay, so let's move around. Pat, you throw in a book. Well, get your helmet. Now, Pat's going to start off as he normally would. He's a good boxer. He's starting off opening up with a jab. I'm going to initiate with my shot to the groin, and that's going to illustrate our half-beat rhythm. One more time now. Open up again, Pat, move around. So now I've got the going, I've got him thinking. I'm moving around, I fake it. Boom, 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 boom. That's when I'm coming back up. Once you hit the groin, then you get that fake. You watch that reaction. Once you got him flinching, you know the fight's over. Now our next scenario is that we're doing our straight blast, but we run out of space. The guy runs right into a wall telephone pole, a car, or whatever. So what you have to do is you have to kick in from the straight blast mode into more of a hooking mode because you don't want to continue punching into the wall if this guy ducks or whatever. A lot of times you get clicked into one mode and bam, 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 and then he falls and you're blasting the wall. So the point is you want to have that killer instinct but the minute you get him pinned up on the wall, it seems to work well to keep the head pinned on the wall and boom, then you have your head butt. As long as you have a hold of his head, and it's on the wall, you know he can't go anywhere, he can't slide down the wall. Good headbutt, that's a nice time for a good headbutt. Now you have to understand something. I'm giving you guys scenarios right now. 
But these scenarios do you no good unless you've spent countless thousands of hours in a ring or a wide open space where you're moving around with a boxer and you have to time when to get in. These are more scenarios where you're walking down the street, bam, and you just go in first. But you have to have fought against a boxer. I have to keep reiterating that. For years you have had to have fought against lightweight boxers, middleweight, heavyweight, Thai boxers. So you have that instinct, that instinctive feeling of when to go in. Take a guy like Hicks and Gracie. The guy, he makes the same entry every time he's got this instinct of boom, when to go in for that tackle. And I don't care who you are, he's going to get you to the ground because he's been in so many street fights. And what we're wanting you to do with the straight blast is to have a similar feeling that you've blasted so many people that you have an instinct of when to go in. In Hickson's case, his instinct is when to take a guy into the ground. In a boxer's case, the instinct may be when to get the jab in. In our case, the instinct is when to climb down this guy's throat with his blast. This is your heart and soul. All right, now remember our scenario. I'm punching the guy, I get him under the wall, I pin the head under the wall, boom, we put in a headbutt. Okay, Kurt, slip on the pad. Put the helmet here. Okay. Now, what happened? We started with the boxing, I kept the hands up, moved a little bit, entered with a kick, blasted to the wall, but notice the part where I froze on the head. I waited a full beat to make sure I had the head on the wall, took my time, boom! That allowed me the time to get the headbutt in. Now I'd like to discuss the straight blast in relationship to ending up on the ground. When you're occupying your center line and you have your punches rolling, it is not possible for somebody to circle their hands around your body and take you to the ground. The last person in the world that should theoretically ever end up on the ground is a Wing Chun man because he's always occupying center line. The way people end up on the ground in a street fight, and the reason that 999 out of 1,000 street fights you do end up on the ground is because people are swinging at each other. And then they're clinching, and then bodies are hugging, and they're on the ground. Brian, come here. Okay? We're pissed off. He throws a punch at me. Boom, I hit him. He hits me. And now we're like this. And we both end up on the ground. But if you have your hands in center line, it's not possible. When he's here and Brian's coming in, bam, I'm hitting him. As long as I'm hitting this here and I have something here, he can't ever get to me. It's almost like if you have a piece of wood, Brian. We're right here. And I'm trying to tackle Brian under the ground. Well, that's what this is right here. This is my work. So as long as I'm occupying center line, now the concept, and that is, you don't always occupy center line against a good wrestler because he's going to fake. There's that uh, element of attribute, that timing. So we can once again sit here and pontificate how we can do this or that against the wrestler, but it's not going to do us any good unless we've had a thousand wrestlers try to take us to the ground. And you have to have them try to really do it. And you have to have the helmet on them. And sometimes they're going to take you to the ground, sometimes they're not. Especially when the helmet's on, because you're not really inflicting the pain. So the concept is, if you understand your hands are in center line, you're not going to go to the ground. However, that's one thing to say, and it's something else to do, so you've got to train it. So what I'd like to do is show you how we're going to train it. Okay, Brian, why don't you throw on the helmet? Now, Brian's a wrestler, we're just moving around a little bit. But the first thing he's going to do is he's going to do what he would normally do in a fight. Brian, I just want you to take me to the ground. We're in a fight. 
Okay. Now that's what you're going to try to do. That's his goal. But me understanding center line, I'm not going to allow him to get those arms around me. Because every time he does, he's going to be hit with punches. Okay, so we're moving around. The first thing is stop. I never allow him to come this close. Make a move. Boom. That's the first thing. So as soon as I start to see him, bam, I'm hitting. I'm stop hitting. So now he has to begin his tackle, not from here, but from here. And that's difficult. As soon as he starts to record, boom, I'm kicking. Or as soon as he starts to record, bam, I'm jabbing. So that's what's, do what's stopping him from getting too close to me. So now when he starts right here and he goes, for up, 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 that's where my blast is. So Brian, you tackle me and come in. Here's where I'm keeping him. So what we do is we train this, go. And now circle down. So every time he starts to get his head down, I'm keeping the punches on. This is a drill I want you to do over and over again. Just put in the man hours, put in the flight time. Against a heavyweight wrestler, a middleweight wrestler, a little quick wrestler, move around in toes, stick and move, hit the thigh. Just when he starts to come in, boom, keep those hands in center line. If he gets a little bit too close, this isn't your other backup. Okay, let you try it. Now at this juncture of the game, we've gone into several different arts out of the blast. We've gone everywhere from China to Japan to the Philippines to America. We've covered a League of Nations here. We don't care. Anything that works, we're trying to use. But the key point in anything we're doing is a training method. This is it. If you look at any sport, it's the same thing. Basketball used to be like this. Hell, I could play the NBA if it was still like that. Then they progress to this, then they progress to this, and now they're doing what they're doing, like Michael Jordan. Okay? So what is the reason? Their training method got better. Same thing with football, same thing with everything else. But if they had the mentality, we've been doing it for 3,000 years this way, continue doing it for 3,000 years this way, great. I'd be in the NBA right now. So the whole point is, if you want anything to improve, you've got to look past tradition. And this is what Bruce was trying to tell people. So he looked past tradition, and then he saw common denominators in other physical actions like sports. And he saw how they trained. And he saw how they progressed. So let's talk a little bit about the training. The straight blast is going to put us in a reference point. But we don't enter with the blast. So let's just reiterate everything. We're moving around in long range. We're kind of feeling like a boxer. Maybe a savat man, maybe a Thai boxer. So what do we have to do to get that part of the fight? We isolate it. You get in the ring with boxers. I want you to have spent at least a thousand man hours with boxers, heavyweight boxers that are hitting you. You can't, once again, sit in your armchair position and be figuring out what is going to work and what isn't. You have to get in the kitchen. This is how you discover the cause of your own ignorance. You have to get in and feel a boxer. You have to get in and feel a Thai boxer. And I don't mean just for a little bit, I mean for a lifetime. You continually put yourself in a vulnerable position. And from there is where you grow. If you rest on your laurels, you're going to stay the way everybody else has been staying, and they're not going to progress. So what exactly is our training method? Our training method is that we get in with the long-range fighters.